So this is the book, and there are copies of it back there, and I actually have more copies with me. Optimist that I am, Pfft, not. Um, but uh, that's the book I'm going to be reading from. Um, so um, I'll, I guess I'll just, I mean, this is really, thank you for coming in the rain. That's the first thing I want to say. Um, and I really, I love reading from this book, and I'm just going to tell you kind of how it happened and how I got, think I started my love of travel. So. Um, when I travel, we, we, as I said, we've been to almost 100 countries and every state in the country. My husband's British. We've traveled for work and for pleasure. And, um, and I always write travel, tra kind of travelogy things, vignettes, which my friends love getting with pictures and stuff, especially since the internet with pictures. And, and I have a friend who, um, who actually her book group is using this book. At the end of the month, I'm going to New Jersey for that. But um, she would always say to me, you should just do a book of these. That's so I just feel like I'm there. It's just, you know, wonderful. So I thought, well, why not? It's already like written. I just have to pull it together and edit it and so forth. Now, a lot of the stories in the book um, were I had said from years, I've been doing them for years, they were on floppies. And, I, and when we started using sticks, I just threw out the floppies, but I had hard copy. So I couldn't just get, you know, get them. Well, I managed to, um, a friend of mine who's a techie, managed to take the, so I picked ones that I thought were reasonably okay and put them together, although they had mess ups in them. And, um, and he was able to create an actual workable MS Word document. So the, the, these are not uh, by any means a complete, a complete book with nearly 100 countries. And some of the, it's random a little bit because of um, what I could access plus newer stuff. However, I did organize them by continent. So there's Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East, and also, um, some of my collections um, are, I, I often combine prose and poetry. So this book is a combination of prose and poetry. It's not a Fodor's, it's very personal stories, some of which are hilarious, some of which are um, poignant, you know. Uh, and, um, and they include personal pictures. Um, the first run of the book, the pictures were all color. Um, let me see in this one. These, this book has color, so you'd be lucky enough to buy one of these. Because for co cost reasons, the publisher on the second run had to go to black and white to make the book a little more affordable. Um, and then there, um, some of them have postscripts about the person I was writing about or whatever. So it's a really um, personal armchair travel book. And people, and it just got a great review um, on, on an online place. And people who read it really seem to like it. So that's how I came to do the book. It was published in March by a small press I've worked with before uh, called Brawler Books in Ohio. And the, they did my last two books. This one is called Children of the Chalet. Um, it's new and selected stories. And, um, and it won an award. That's what the gold seal was for um, fiction. And the day that I was to get my 50 free copies, the day I was to get my copies, this company went under. And the guy I was working with was, felt so badly that we weren't grandfathered, those of us that were in process, that he committed to me to send me 50, to get me the 50 books they were sending me. So I did get them. However, the covers were incomplete. So I can only give them away or sell them for five bucks or something. They're missing the um, attribution of the quotes, and they're missing the publisher's imprint, and they're missing the award piece. Anyway, that book, I didn't bring these books with me, but I did bring the postcards if you're interested in them. And then I worked with him again. The same friend who told me to do this book, asked me to do this book. Um, we, we are a part of a women's group. And in the last three years, uh, several of the women in that group have lost their partners or have been caregivers. And so we did a lot of talking about that. And she said, you know, you should really do a book about that, because I've done anthologies. And so this is my fourth anthology done with the same production house, which is very small. Um, and it's 21 women caregivers writing beautiful pieces to, in support of other women caregivers, also in prose and poetry. And this one is my one and only novel, which I'm actually about to undertake revising and trying to sell to a bigger house. Um, and this is called Hester's Daughters, and it's a contemporary feminist sort of retelling of The Scarlet Letter. So all the key events in The Scarlet Letter are replicated in modern context. So, and then I have um, and other books, anthologies, and short stories and stuff. But um, so let me tell you quickly where my, it's in the preface of the book. My, my love of travel really derives from the fact that my father was, my parents were immigrants actually at the turn of the century when they were little, the last, the 1900s, when they were very young um, because they were both born in the Ukraine 
and the pogroms in the early 1900s, the pogroms against the Jews were pretty awful. So my, they both, both families had emigrated. My father's family went to Canada. Some of my mom's family went there, but mostly they came to Philadelphia. And so every summer, my father was a small scale merchant. He was a haberdasher in New Jersey, where I grew up. Actually, he looked just like Harry Truman, who was also a haberdasher. Um, and our summer holiday was that we would go, every summer for two weeks, we would go to Toronto to visit family but it was in the days when um, there wasn't, there weren't um, uh, superhighways. So we would go, we would come up through New England or New York State, always Niagara Falls. So it was very scenic, and, we, and we'd stay at there was no Holiday Inn thing or whatever. So we'd stay in AAA approved motels with the Chanel bedspreads and the peeling linoleum and all that. Um, but it was so exciting to, as a child to wake up every that morning. And we had laid our new clothes, our little sandals and our t-shirts and stuff out on the bed. At six o'clock in the morning, we'd get up and we would drive for a bit and then we'd go to Howard Johnson's for breakfast. And then they were favorite, and we were crossing a border and the money changed and you know stuff like that. So um, I think that's really what it began to instill in me that, that, that love of travel. And then when I was young, when I was in my early 20s, um, I was living in New York with my, room, my college roommate and um, we decided we were gonna go to Europe However, we didn't have this. We had to wait a year because we had to save money. So we said, "Well, we're not going to go anywhere this summer. We'll go each of us home." Well, she went home and got engaged to the boy next door from high school. So I said, "I'm not. I'm not waiting." So I, the following year, with hotel reservations and a real pass, traveled by myself um, in, throughout Euro, uh, several countries in Europe. What and, that? pardon? What year was that? That was uh, 1965. I was tw I was 21. <laughs> I was 21. Yeah. Um, and that trip, honestly, in very archetypal terms, changed my life. I just felt as if I had crawled back into my own skin. You know, I, had, I, I just found it a very sensual experience. I could be honest. I would meet these amazing people, one after the other, um, figuring out the currencies and the geography and all that. And, um, and, I, and I came back feeling like I, I can never marry an American. This is, this is, a, this is First of all, there's such a genuine exchange with foreign people, and, and it's, it's not sexual, it's sensual, you know? You can be who you are. And here was my sister saying to me, don't let the boys know how smart you are because they won't like that. And I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. Um, but there I felt I could be very real, and, um, and it, that really was a profound trip for me. So, um, so the, there have been these milestones in my, in my journey that have give, given me the love of travel. So um, in my professional work, um, I, I was, um, first of all, on a national level, I've worked in women's health advocacy and education, and that's where my heart really is. And, and, I've been a, and then I had an academic career in gender studies. Um, and then when I got my master's degree, I, uh, I did it in health communications, which is not about how to talk to your doctor. It's a whole multidisciplinary um, methodology about behavior change for health promotion using communication. And I began to write professionally a lot about that in the 80s. And I also, in the 80s, went to, I covered the Nairobi, um, the UN Conference for Women, if you recall, the middle one was in Nairobi, and I went to that, I covered that. Um, and then I was in the Beijing Conference. Anyway, when I got my master's, um, I was by that time interested in working um, internationally because the health promotion stuff had, that I was studying and working on had to do with um, child survival, so Im immunization, getting, uh, uh, knowing ORT, oral rehydration therapy, breastfeeding, family planning. So I actually was managing, I was deputy director of a big international USAID funded um, health communications project, the first one that AID ever did. Um, and so that was how I started being international. My husband, who's British, had come for, to the States from the British Treasury. Actually, I met him at the embassy in Washington. Um, and he subsequently left the Treasury to join the World Bank. So we were both traveling a lot, and we were able to, um, we got home leave to England every two years with the kids, and so we could travel from there. Sometimes we could segue our trips and meet up somewhere, and a few times I actually went with him, or he came with me. So that was how we expanded this whole travel thing. Um, so I don't do that work anymore. Um, I do writing workshops, and um, I consider myself a full-time writer and lecturer and so on. Um, but one of the things I have done in the last few years is I've done several volunteer trips um, as a doula. I'm a doula. Uh, do you know what a doula is? So a doula, so a doula is not the midwife. I don't catch the babies. <laughs> what we are there for as, as, is solely to provide emotional and, uh, and physical support for the laboring mother, labor and delivery, and the family. 
And so I, I, wanted, to do, I, I wanted to do that in, in, uh, abroad. So the first time I did it was in the capital of Somaliland, which is a, a, it sees itself as an independent country from Somalia, but it's really a chunk of Somalia. It does have its own capital city, its own currency and stuff like that. And the, what, the hospital I went to was, the woman was written up in um, Nicholas Kristof's book, um, holding up half, something about holding up half the sky or something. Um, so I went there, and that was an interesting experience. Um, I did a lot of birthing with women there, um, taught nurses about support and so forth. The second time I did it was in Greece. With um, I'd met there, I had met a French um, research physician, a woman who spoke French and Greek, because her husband's a yacht captain and they live in Greek a lot, in Greece a lot. And the next opportunity was to, I had was to work with, as a doula uh, in Greece with refugee women. And I asked Brigitte to come with me, and she did, thank God, because otherwise I would have had to come home because it was so poorly organized and I don't speak Greek and whatever. So that was the second experience. I didn't get to do birthing there, but we were with supporting pregnant women. And then the third time was in, uh, when I just came back from Peru, where there were no patients and no, nobody there because the hospital hadn't been certified yet. So. Um, so those are some of the experiences I've had. So I, one of the pieces that I like to read from the book, I, I enjoy reading from this book, is, has to do with when I was transiting to um, Hargeza, i flown Emirates to um, Dubai and then on down. Uh, and this is a story that derives from that. Um, hang on just a second. It's called Dubai Desert Wish. And the guy I'm, there's a picture of the guy that I'm going to read about, but he actually made the cover as well. So Dubai Desert Wish. Against my better judgment, I await the driver who will take me from the lobby of my hotel to an evening in the desert near Dubai, city of concrete, chrome, and glass. I know that I've signed on for a typical tourist excursion that includes racing over sand dunes in a specially designed vehicle, riding a camel, and getting your hands decorated with henna if you wish. But I have only one layover day in Dubai, and I figure that dinner in the desert under the stars is worth the cost of the trip. The driver, who bears a striking resemblance to a young version of Libya's late dictator Muammar al-Qaddafi, greets me wearing men's traditional long white robe known as dishdash and a head scarf or kafia held in place by a braided red cloth encircling his head. You know, Arafat used to wear them. Uh, we are joined by a French woman and her young son and a young woman from South Africa who climb into the back seat, leaving me to ride shotgun with Qaddafi. This is fortuitous because I get to talk to him like the feminist and journalist that I am. I ask him questions about the landscape as we set out on our one hour journey and about his country's culture. As he relaxes into the conversation, which my companions also are enjoying, I tell him laughingly who he reminds me of and he thinks it's funny too. Then I ask about his family. His wife, he tells us, was killed in a car crash, leaving him with three children, one of whom is a little girl. Welcome. <laughs> um, they all live with his parents now. It's a tragic story that makes me sad. I ask about her and their life together in such a conservative culture. Was yours an arranged marriage, I ask? Of course. Did she wear an abaya and hijab? Of course. Was she permitted to go out by herself? Not necessary. Did he think she would have liked more independence? No. I take a risk and deepen the conversation. Qaddafi, I realize, thinks I'm crazy the more we talk. But to his credit, he continues engaging with me. Do you think your wife and other women like her ever long for more in life than simply being their husband's cook, maid, laundress, mother of their children? And then I added the term sexual vessel. I, know, I knew he didn't know what it would mean, but I had just come from a country where women have their genitals cut off and have no voice and have no, no nothing. Um, so I, for readers of the book, I put it in. I, I explained to him that I've just come from Somaliland where women are chattel. They have no voice, no right to their own bodies, no personal possessions, no way to be people. They are simply property, deprived of everything but survival if they're lucky. And I say that because um, in Somaliland, 99.9 .9 of the women are completely infibulated. They cannot have, they cannot have a, a C-section, med a medically necessary C-section unless their husband agrees. Very often, their attitude is inshallah, and they don't agree. And if they have to have a hysterectomy, they have to have the father's permission because he owns her body. That's how bad it is. Um, so, so I say, I, I, um, 
do, I, I asked the question, do you think your wife and other women like her long for more than what they have? No, he says, adding, she get to sit in front of car like you. I can't stop thinking about his wife. I wonder what she might have been like if she'd been born somewhere else. I wonder if she and I could have talked honestly if we'd ever met. I explained to Gaddafi that in my country, his, my, his wife might be called a victim of culture. Maybe you're a victim too, I suggest. Maybe you would have been enriched if she'd had more freedom to be who she was in her heart. He looks at me like I'm nuts. We arrive at the desert and Gaddafi dutifully starts our high speed, terrifying sand dune dips and swerves. We beg him to stop, but he thinks we're having fun. <clears throat> when we convince him we really want to forfeit this part of the trip, he relents and takes us to the campsite where we forgo camels, I'd already ridden a camel, and henna and are seated on carpets for dinner under the stars. On the trip back to the city, I notice that Gaddafi has removed his keffiyeh, relieved, it seems to me, that he can drop the facade that is part of a job he wishes he didn't have to do. This time, I ask about his daughter. She's eight years old and completely enveloped in the traditional life they lead. What do you think she would like to be when she grows up, if she could choose? I ask. Gaddafi looks at me, at me like I'm totally ridiculous. What if she could go to school, maybe be a teacher or a nurse or even a doctor? I continue. Think about that. She'd probably, she's probably full of life. Don't you want her to be all that she dreams of? For some reason, I feel a fierce attachment to this unseen child. I care about her just as I feel sad for her mother and all the other females like them. I think Gaddafi is probably a good man in a bad culture. I really want to reach him. Listen, I say, I tell him about the work that I do to help make the lives of women and girls better. I explain Western ideas about human rights, women's rights, freedom, and autonomy. I talk about living the fullest life possible as God's gift and blessing. I can't be sure, but maybe, just maybe, I've planted a seed. I'm telling you, I smile, I'm gonna be on your shoulder as that little girl grows up. I'm gonna keep whispering in your ear about her. I won't go away, so watch out. I'm always gonna be there for her. When he drops us off at the hotel, Gaddafi smiles at me. I extend my hand and he actually shakes it, which is big. Um, I, I'm glad I've gone to the desert in a dune buggy. It's an experience I don't forget. Perhaps Gaddafi remembers it too. It's several years now since I was in Dubai. I still think about that little girl and I still whisper in Gaddafi's ear. I like to think he hears me as he watches his daughter dance to her dreams. I like to imagine that he takes joy in seeing the young woman she's becoming. I know it's a long shot, but hey, a girl can dream at any age, can't she? And this postscript is, I often do think about that little girl and wonder if her father thinks of me as she grows older. You don't always know when you have made a difference in someone's life. So welcome, you didn't miss much. I was talking about how I came to love travel and my work that took me places and stuff like that. Where's okay. Work? Pardon? Where's your work? My, well, my work, my work for many years professionally was um, doing um, international women's health promotion and um, child survival health promotion through communications. Yeah, and, and then I had an academic career and now I'm a full-time writer. Um, Well, it was one, let me say it was what I expected because I knew it was one of those like touristy things. Um, so, you know, it, so I, that part didn't interest me. Uh, but we did sit on, and of course there are a lot of people who come from all the hotels and everything. So there's carpets spread out all over. It is really desert. You drive an hour through the desert and you pass a couple of farms and stuff. And, um, and, the, and the food, you sit on, the, on these rugs and uh, there are low tables. and. The food is brought to you, and it's very traditional food. And it is, you can see the stars like crazy. And it's like low hanging. What, what, like? Low hanging stars, like, you know, like, you know how sometimes you see a video or a picture? No, just, no, it's just like seeing stars where there's no lights. Okay. <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite. It, it might have been that romantic if there were fewer people, and not all the stuff that happens before with the henna and all that kind of stuff. But it was, it was worth it. it was, well, actually, it was worth it to me. It, you know, people always say to me, what's your favorite country, your place, or, you know. And honestly, the answer is, where my, where the, it, it, it's based on the people. When you have an experience like this, and I've had many, many of them, many exchanges that are deeply meaningful, and many that are in this book, 
um, that's the place I love, you know. I, I do love Italy as my favorite uh, European country. I love Thailand because I did live there. Um, but there are many places I love, and usually it's because I've had an extraordinary exchange while I've been there. Um, so part of, I'll read you, a, as I said, there is poetry in this book, and um, at the end of the book, there's a short section called, um, uh, let me just see what I forget what I called it. Um, some of these are North American trips that are funny, too. Um, uh, it's called Global Perspectives in Poetry. And I'll just read you two of them. Um, one is called All the Starving Children. Their eyes are everywhere, the children for whom I ate green peas when I was young. Their eyes are everywhere, staring at me from dark hollow pools of despair. In Mexico, they sprawl on the pavement, claiming scraps of newspaper for home. Bony fingers stretch out like splayed chicken feet. It's one o'clock in the morning, but they are wide-eyed and their eyes are everywhere. In Bangladesh, they buzz around my car like flies on mucus-filled noses and dry lips. Their hands have that same withered habitual crook, inverted, paralyzed, and their eyes are everywhere. In Somalia, they drag themselves, collapsing in the dust like tumbleweed blown in by non-existent breezes. Their eyelids droop down, concealing glazed pupils, and still, their eyes are everywhere. Their eyes are everywhere, forcing me to avert mine. And uh, I, there, um, I, I did a poem called, um, I listen to my heart, I, I listen and my heart is breaking, which I'll share with you. I wrote it at the 1985 UN conference in, uh, for women. And Sweet Honey and the Rock, have you ever heard of, of them? So they put it to music. They, they, and I actually got royalties for a while. So I listen and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women of Rio. These, these are all based on actual testimonies at the conference. I listen to the women of Rio when they speak of street children murdered and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women of Chernobyl. I tell of childish faces grown old and lifeless and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women of Bhopal whisper the grotesqueness of deformity and disease and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women on the Solomons giving testimony to jellyfish, babies born without limbs, and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women of Manila mourning the prostitution of their daughters, and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women of Addis Ababa describing empty stomachs and drought, and my heart is breaking. I listen to the women of Cyprus and Ireland and Sri Lanka and South Africa. I hear conflict's pain, and my heart is breaking. But also, I listen to the Madres and the women in black and African mamas, I listen to young women of Asia and the Pacific Rim. I listen to the female voice of North Africa and the Middle East and Eastern Europe, and I hear the power of every woman, everywhere. Then I rejoice, I hope, I take heart. Um, and as I said, I wrote that poem, uh, you know, at, in, at the Decade Conference and Sweet Honey to, in the Rock set it, set it to music. There's one, there's one other poem that I will read you from that section called Getting Religion. Um, Sometimes I get emotional at the end of this poem, so don't worry if I get a little emotional, I'll be fine. I often cry at my own work. Um, I went to the remnants of the Berlin Wall, stood at the foot of the Brandenburg Gates, crossed the barren border of Checkpoint Charlie, and weeping in chill wind for all that had happened there, I found religion. I saw the simple burial ground of Geza Gardonia, folk hero of Hungary, who told the tale of their liberation. I walked the streets of Buda, Pest, and Eger, where hideous acts of history made me question the essence of humanity, and still I found religion. I visited the land of Laklav Havel and Smetana's Mavlast and watched cheerful queues of Czechs anxious to view their heritage on the day ancient crown jewels were shown. I pressed my face against an iron fence to see the jumbled graves of the Prague ghetto, and there too I found religion. But it wasn't in the great cathedrals, where cold, cavernous spaces drip gold and icons gazing heavenward ignore beggars near the nave, nor in the Gothic grandeur of Tyne Church, nor in the Baroque splendor of St. Vitus and St. George. Neither monastery nor chapel could claim it. I found it instead in the humble face of the waiter in East Berlin and in the eager eyes of a hotel hostess who finally had a passport. I saw it in the kind mustache smile of an old man playing accordion on the Charles Bridge, and in the boy who spoke perfect English, 
selling Russian souvenirs to new tourists under the bronze majesty of Jan Hus. I, rejo I rejoiced in it in the beer halls and in the wine cellars and in the shops, museums, and theaters. I celebrated its pulse in Hungarian laughter and its pathos in Czech poetry and hungry human connection. I found religion in Eastern Europe, holy, holy, and its name is freedom. So I'm going to read you one more thing, and we'll talk then. Um, a lighter piece, which is um, from my, I did a, a, when I was in Thailand, um, I kept a journal, and I, that became a, a, um, a sort of a memoir. It's called um, A Chan, which means professor, a year of teaching in Thailand. And it was just basically my edited journal. And I had a neighbor there. Well, actually, when I tried to find housing, somebody who'd been there before told me about this woman who was a real estate agent, she said. So I contacted her, and she said, yes, she had a little bungalow that she'd found for me. It was affordable. Um, well, it turned out that she was my next door neighbor. So we, we had identical bungalows. And, um, and it, it, we just became such close friends, I can't even tell you. It was like one house, you know? I was in my pajamas there. And actually, there's a funny story about her being in her house. So she spoke English. But her husband, Dwi, didn't speak a word of English. And we used to have a hell of a good time with him. And so one day, um, he, he didn't speak English, but he loved karaoke. So one day, I went, my water wasn't running. So I went over there to take a shower. And we, our, each of us had a bathroom downstairs, a complete bathroom. But neither of us used the shower. We only used it like a powder room, because we had an upstairs bathroom. So there were no shower curtains. So Dwi thinks that I'm Lena taking a shower, right? So he opens the door and walks in and sees me. And I'm like this, and he rushes out. And the next thing I hear, guy doesn't speak English, I saw her standing there. <laughs> anyway, we used to travel around um, Tha uh, Thailand with them. And I got to go to the table of contents to find this. But we had some funny experiences. Um, what city was that? 70, Chiang Mai. Yeah. Is that, were you there? Yeah. Ch but Bangkok is like two days, and you could, that's it. Go to the palace, you know? Um, OK, so, and we traveled a lot while I was living there. We were in Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Laos, um, um, Laos, India, Indonesia. We did a lot of traveling. And our, we worked a lot in e Asia, too. OK, so th these are just a little outtakes from the whole book that I wrote. This is Thailand, silly. The re reality of living in a land you love, frustrations and all. There's an expression among Farang, what, that means Westerners, living in Thailand. This is Thailand, silly. We use it to remind each other of Thai reality when things are hilarious or frustrating, and they're often both. And just an example of hilarious is the signs are hilarious because they don't spell things correctly. But my favorite sign of all was in a woman's bathroom, and it said, please do not throw sanity in toilet. <laughs> <laughs> With our Thai friends Lena and Dwi, we drive from Chiang Mai to Bangkok, a nine-hour journey. Early next morning, we head for the beach resort of Pattaya. Now, what's not included in this piece is Oh, yeah, it is included. OK. Early next morning, we head for the beach resort of Pattaya. No sooner have I navigated onto an eight-lane highway when suddenly our rental car belches grinding noises and slows to a near halt. A burning odor is ominous. I inch left, try, uh, ties drive on the left side, cross eight lanes, and coast to a stop on the narrow shoulder. Lena, epitome of the Thai concept of Jayen, cool heart, pulls out her so cell phone. She calls the tourist police and the police department's road service division. Both promise to send help. Then she calls Avis rental car at Don Muang Airport, a few kilometers behind us. There's now a big new airport. The agent offers a promotion. I get on the line to book it. What is your fax, please, the agent asks. I'm in the middle of an eight-lane highway in a broken down car. Oh, Sally, Sally, you have email? By now, my jai is not so yen. I hand the phone back to Lena. I call you later, she says. My husband, meanwhile, is on his cell to Kun Tan, from whom we have rented the car. He explains the situation, then says, what? I'm in the middle of Bangkok's busiest highway. I can't check the transmission fluid. An hour later, we're still awaiting help. Lena suggests she and I grab a taxi and head for the airport to rent a car. Now, you have to visualize this. Lena's pretty and has long, uh, long dark hair, and that day, because we were going to the beach, she was wearing like a beach outfit that looked like baby doll pajamas, you know, like like short cut off thing and a shirt with a bow. And it was like she looked like a little girl. Um, so she eff effortlessly, she flags a cab and we're off to Don Wang, leaving husbands to mind the rent -a -rec. Hertz says they have a special, but only good for shift. I say, I can drive manual. Sally, he said, my me, don't have. 
My cell rings. It's my husband. I need a Hang Nam toilet. Can you hurry? Dwi, meanwhile, has spotted a Mitsubishi dealer across the highway from where they're stranded. He calls on his cell and tells the repair shop that he has a dead car on the highway and a farang with a full bladder. You drive Mitsubishi, the repairman said. Dwi confirms, so the guy says, okay, my husband can use the restroom. The tourist police arrive, stops eight, arrives, stops eight lanes of traffic in the opposite direction and leads my husband, actually takes him by the hand, <laughs> across um, to the Mitsubishi Hangnam. Simultaneously, Lena and I arrive at the dealership in our new rental car. We head for the beach, only five hours behind schedule. This is another vignette. <clears throat> it's 9 p.m. when our landlords knock on the door. We have recently informed them we would leave Chiang Mai sooner than expected because my work is finished. They demand the rent. We explain that since they're holding two months security, we have already paid for our last month. Mrs. Landlord, an atypical aggressive Thai woman, says we must forfeit our security deposit and pay another month's rent or she will change the locks. We invite her to return with a copy of the contract the next night. At 5 p.m., everyone assembles, <clears throat> including a lawyer we have engaged, and Lena. We serve soft drinks and go through the expected amenities. Then the fireworks begin. We point to Clause 9 of the contract, which states that we are entitled to a full refund of our deposit because we have given 30 days' notice. Mrs. Landlord threatens to call the police. I say, that's a good idea. Mr. Landlord impugns Lena's integrity. I threaten to evict him. Then I offer to take them to court to settle the matter. The lawyer waits for the shouting match to end before quietly informing Mr. and Mrs. Landlord that it is against Thai law to forcefully evict tenants. He suggests they accept our deposit as payment in full. Mr. Landlord weakens. Mrs. Landlord continues to rant. And in the end, we agree to this solution and the landlords depart. All smiles and kapun kas. Thank yous. I usher them out, weigh, 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 weighing, you know, bowing, only to the lawyer. And this is the third excerpt, which is the last one. Our friends arrive from the States. After several days touring Chiang Mai, we head for the Golden Triangle. Our first stop is Mae Salong, where our travel book advises we must not miss the Mae Salong Resort. As evening approaches, we snake our way up a mountain in foggy rain, anticipating, quote, the best views of terraced hills and outstanding Yunnanese food. This village was founded by Chinese escaping Mao's cultural revolution. The term resort is usually, loosed in Tha usually, is used loosely in Thailand, but what a misnomer for the hotel we find ourselves in. Without checking the room, we plunk down 420 baht per couple, a supposed 40% discount on the usual rate. But after seeing the accommodations, we upgrade to so-called VIP rooms. These are large, dirty digs adjacent to staff quarters. Our view is drying laundry, wood piles, and motorbikes. The rooms are dank and dirty. Water runs brown from the taps. The wastebaskets are fuzzy. The sheets and towels appear used. The odor is eau de mold. We, pass a we had passed a luxury place a mile back, but would they have room and would driving in wet darkness be sensible? I would have done it. The others voted not to. We accept our fate for the night, a Buddhist but ultimately bad decision. We visit the restaurant for the promised Chinese fare, but find a motley crew of servers, stained tablecloths, and a very limited menu. We order several dishes. A plate of chicken appears with boiled rice and two plates of what look like weeds cooked in mud. Chinese eggplant, very good, you try, the waitress says. We return hungry to our cobweb VIP lounge to drown our sorrows, agreeing to abscond in the morning without paying the difference owed on our rooms. None of us is able to sleep in the damp beds and no one dreams of showering. Our friends find a huge cockroach in their bed. Actually, <laughs> Jean said, we should cut off its legs and make a coffee table. And, and Bob said, I thought it was the pool boy making a pass. <laughs> in the morning, we head downhill to the beautifully gardened luxury hotel for breakfast and discover we could have stayed for 650 baht. Later, the resort calls to ask for their 1,500 baht they think we owe. We say we are calling the ministries of health and tourism. Most accommodations, and it should be noted that most accommodations and restaurants in Thailand are good to spend, to, to splendid, but it's best to look before you book. I had booked because we were arriving at night and we were three couples, we needed three rooms. And I just, don't use DK, don't use DK travel guides for places to stay or eat, absolutely do not. Uh, but they're very good for pictures and places, okay? Thailand is a wonderful country full of smiling people, colorful sights, delicious foods, and glorious crafts. I'd live there again in a heartbeat, but having done so, I'd know that life can be frustrating and very funny. Sometimes you just have to shrug and say, this is Thailand, silly. Um, 
and there, there are no shortage of Buddhas to see. Oh, there's a picture of a Buddha with this piece. So the, the postscript is, there's no shortage of Buddhas to see in Thailand. And the picture of the one in here is the Emerald Buddha at the Royal Palace. And if you go, have you been to Th uh, Bangkok? We stayed in Chiang You didn't go to Bangkok? You talked The Emerald Buddha? Yeah. So you didn't get caught in the scam about the, the guy who says to you, oh, the temple's closed for cleaning right now, but my friend with his tuk-tuk, he can take you around it's and he'll... Oh, okay, because that's the scam. He can take you around while there's being clean. It's not being cleaned. And I told my friends, don't fall for it, and they fell for it, you know? So, um, pardon? How big is this Emerald Buddha? It's not, very, it's not that big. There are many, many very big Buddhas, and the, rec the reclining gold Buddha is very, very big. The Emerald Buddha is probably about not much bigger than this height of this. Is it a real Emerald? Yes, it is really Emerald. Pardon? That's pretty big for an emerald. Uh, well, I, I think it's really emerald. I think it really is. It's, I know it's, you know, really guarded, you know, mm -hmm. so. It's not something you'd wear for, uh, no. for you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't carry it around anywhere. <laughs> but the, uh, Chiang Mai is the craft center. It's the, the north is where the, really the crafts um, come from. And often they're coming in from Burma and Laos and uh, other places, but the night markets are just to die for. Oh my God. Yeah. Until you finally figure out that everybody's selling the same thing and you'll, you know, but it, you could lose your mind the first few times you go. Um, and the food is wonderful. You could have like the best food for like, like um, probably the equivalent of $3, yeah. you know? Yeah. I used to buy sticky mango with rice on the street. And the other thing is massages. Oh my God. I had a woman come to my house for two hours on a Saturday for a two hour, massa yeah, two hour massage. And it was, um, it was $5. Yeah. I, got a, I got, used to get a haircut, manicure, pedicure, and massage all for $25. Yeah. Really amazing. And, and foot massages, you're just walking down the street, you get them anywhere. And they're always good. So I, I was very spoiled. <laughs> Fish that uh, leech it? Your Leeches? Leeches? <laughs> the little fish. I didn't have. I don't do. I didn't do that. I thought it was Jane Fonda. I didn't do that. <laughs> so so one day, Lena and another friend of ours, an American, Laura, we went down to Bangkok for the weekend, and we went to the Chinese market area. The one night we got there, and we had um, foot massages, and. The, two, the people that were working on us were all laughing and kibitzing or whatever. And Lena starts laughing her head off, laughing her head off. Oh, and then they said, is, oh, is she, La is she, Lena, is she your guide? No. Is she your translator? No. She's our friend. And they were like, you know. Anyway, Lena's laughing her head off. And afterwards, we said, what was so funny? She said, one of them said to the other one, I love Farang money, but I can't stand the way their feet smell. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm not going to read uh, more because let's have some time to talk. And also, if I read much more, you won't buy the book. <laughs> so, but that, that's, you know, there's a, there's a, and I should say that many of the pieces in here have been published. And one of them is uh, about spending a night in a train station in India. Um, and we needed to get, we had reserved, for, you know, a, a, a cabin, which you share, but it's a private space. Um, and, and we needed to get back to um, New Delhi to catch our flight the next day. Well, we spent the night and the pretty much of the night in the station in a town called Jansi because the, tra the trains are always late. And there was a hilarious event there about um, my husband going into this with the cook, took, the cook and the driver from where we stayed took us there and they wouldn't leave us until we were on the train and the, ended up taking my husband to the station master's office and it was wild with people, you know, screaming and yelling and everything. And when he walked in, it all went very quiet and he was escorted up to the station master who said, you know, and may I help, may I be of service, sir? Anyway, long story short, he got us on the next train in second class. Uh, but it's a very funny story. Well, it's, it's a funny story, but it's also a, a vivid description of what it's, what it's like in India. I mean, we're a better place than in a train station in the middle of the night with rats as big as rabbits and gypsies and, you know, vendors and half-naked men and business people in suits who are saying, I hope you are not getting the wrong impression of India. Um, you know, <laughs> India is a fascinating place. Yeah. India is fascinating. I mean, I literally saw a camel at a gas station. Um, and we were walking down the street one day, we ended up at somebody's wedding. I mean, it was, it's really fun. So anyway, um, questions, comments, travel experiences? Yeah, I'm going to Israel uh, this next year. I'm wondering if you've been. 
I've been to Israel, and I've been to Israel at a really good time. It was safe and open, and I, I am Jewish, but I have a lot of trouble with Israel right now and their, their um, human rights abuses of the Palestinians. The poem I read, you remember I said, uh, I think about the women in black. Do you know about them? There, is, there are uh, Jewish and Palestinian women who I think, I don't know if they're still doing it, but for many, many years, and it actually became a global movement, uh, every Friday they would stand on various corners in Israel as a peace protest. And they were, I, w I stood with them, and I, I couldn't get a cab to pick me up because it was Friday and I was in black, so he knew where I wanted to go. Um, and I actually was frightened because they had been st stoned, and they are called the whores of Hamas, and which I've been called for writing about what the, Israel's doing to the Palestinians. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, and then also, uh, there's a piece in the book actually about Israel and my conflict with being a feminist and being a Jew in Israel because obviously everybody Jewish would, would feel something there. Um, you know, we all, even if you didn't go through the Holocaust, it's part of our history. Um, but as a feminist, I like lost my mind because, you know, the women at the Wailing Wall cannot be on the side where the most religious part is. It's a small space in the sun that only the men get to be over there. So that made me nuts. And then there was an exhibit at the um, King David Museum called Man and His Kitchen. There were escort services in every magazine. The women in the army are not treated equally. Um, I had lots of women. I got yelled at because in 110 degrees, I had a long dress on, but it was a sundress that had straps that I had to cover myself. I, a woman who I thought was a prop, you know, I always assume somebody's like me, so she was Western dressed and she was at the wall and she was selling something or whatever. And um, I start talking to her and she starts asking me if I observe the Sabbath and if I do this and if I do that and why don't you go, aren't you going to the wall and to touch the wall? And I said, well, when I can touch it on that side, I'll do that. And, I, and then, um, and then we got in this conversation about, you know, Orthodox women have to be outside of the marital bed when they're menstruating and for two weeks afterwards. That means they're in the bed when they're fertile. So that's why the Orthodox women have a lot of children. Um, and I, uh, you know, and I said something to that, about that to her and she, oh, it's just tradition, it's just that, you know. So like, I was like losing my stuff there, but um, so I was very conflicted, it's in the book. Mm -hmm. So you were screaming too? I, w I tried not to scream, but I was, I was uh, firm, shall we say. Yes, I was firm. <laughs> I've been firm in a lot of my travel. You'll see in a lot of my travel stories, I'm firm. Like when I go to, when I go to a place like Dubai and, the, and they have a complimentary night in a hotel because they always have to stay overnight to catch your ongoing flight. And I'm in a line with, to try to check into this hotel and there are three lines and I'm the middle one, right? And I suddenly realize that every time it's my turn, the guy from this side goes up and the guy from that side goes up and this and this and this. And finally, I just said, stop, it's my turn. We all have to check in, you know? So I got checked in, you know, that kind of thing. And, well, no, so, here's, so here's a good story about that. So here's a, a good story about that. So I'm at the airport in, um, I guess it was, I guess it was Dubai and, um, and I'm trying to ask the guy simply, is, is Jay an aisle seat? Am I in an aisle seat? And he keeps telling me I have to go in another room where there's all kinds of people, but there's no personnel there. It's a simple question. So finally I say to him, is Jay an aisle seat? He says, yes. So I say, now there, that wasn't so hard, was it? And then, um, and then when I was p getting on the plane, I said to the woman taking the tickets, I said, um, how in the world do you women live here? And she said, well, you have to be very strong. And I said, well, I am not exactly a potted plant. And she said, no, madam, I noticed. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to be assertive. You also have to be careful. You have to keep your antenna up as a woman alone. You know, I've had some dicey experiences. Um, and, and you just learn where, how to get help or how to, how to make it go away, <laughs> you know, um, especially when I was much younger. How do you balance respect for another culture with what you Feel is right as far as women's rights go, or, or any kind of rights. Yeah. How do, you, how do you balance that? Well, I certainly really work hard at not being judgmental or, or, um, or antagonistic. And I pose things as questions. And I say, you know, I know I'm speaking from a Western perspective, you know, and I know how hard it is for girls to get educated, and I know this and that. So I'm just wondering, you know, help me to understand, right. you know. But I would never overtly judge it, although I, in my head I might be.
Well, I try to even do it in my head. I try to be cult really culturally sensitive and understand the ethos, but also to explore, you know, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a communicator. I believe in communicating to learn, you know? So I've never been accused of offending somebody that way. Uh, so so there, I'm going to conclude with this. There are three questions that people always ask me when I'm reading, whether it's this book or any other book I've done. And I just wanted to see if you can, if those questions would have been questions in your mind. What do you think the three most... And it's not, it can, you can ask me whatever you want about travel writing, but it's not just about this book. It's about being a writer or being a feminist writer. Or, but, but there's three, gen, three generic questions that people always ask. What do you think they might be? <laughs> so one is, one, two of them are simple. One is people say, do I write every day? And my answer is, <clears throat> I don't write every day, but I'm always thinking about writing and what I want to write and how I'm going to say it and all that kind of stuff. Part of the reason I don't write every day is because writers have to do other things. So like I teach and I give lectures and workshops and that takes work and promoting the work takes work and stuff like that. Another one is do I journal? And my answer to that is I do not keep a traditional journal. But again, I'm journaling all the time because I write um, newspaper columns, commentary. So I process everything that way. That's, those are my journals. And that's why I've actually published three volumes of them. But now I don't anymore because they don't sell. But um, that's how I journal. And the other one is, um, how, how and when did I know that, that I wanted to be a writer? And just quickly, I mean, I think I'd, I always had it in me. When I was very young, I think I couldn't have been more than maybe even eight or nine, no more than 10. I went to the, I lived in a small town. My father's business was in the middle of the business block. And at each end, there was a five and dime. And I went to the Kresge's or whatever and said, I want to buy the biggest, the thickest tablet that you have. And the woman said, oh, why would you like the thickest tablet? I said, well, if I tell you, you're going to laugh at me. And I, she said, no, I won't. I said, because I'm going to write a book. And she didn't laugh at me, which was really good. And then when I was 13, I didn't write the book. But, and then when I was 13, I submitted my first, my first submission to this. And it was a, po a Christmas poem to the Saturday Evening Post. And then I, wa I won a short story competition at school. And I used to love writing school papers and mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So I just, you know, I just always had it, had it in me. English, English and psychology. Bec and I did that because I wanted to do that because I felt that I could get more history and philosophy and psychology and stuff through literature than to focus only on one, you know. That was how I wanted to, because I was always an avid reader. I was reading Henry James when I was really young and, you know, so I was learning about people, you know, cultures and people. Um, and then when I got my master's, I didn't want an MPH because they were very um, geared to, um, sort of biological stuff, and I didn't want that. I wanted cultural stuff. I, I like um, qu uh, qualitative research. I'm not into qu quantitative research. Mm -hmm. So that was why I picked that. And it was a new field, so. Are you the only traveler in your family as far as your siblings go and your parents? Are you the? My, pa the only, my parents were not travelers. They would go to Florida in the, in the winter, and then we would do this kind of trip. And they didn't have the, 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 the resources, yeah. I think, or even the curiosity. Um, so they were not travelers. Um, my siblings, um, sadly, both died pretty young. My sister was 52 and my brother was 45, a year apart, uh, both unexpected. And um, so they, they didn't travel the way I do, um, the, the way we do. But I think, you know, they, they'd been places. And I think, I don't know, my brother's career was, he was busy. And I don't know, they just didn't have it the way I had it, you know. We, we find our biggest challenge is Unless you are a traveler, people really aren't interested in your travel. Our kids don't even know where we are. Is that right? And they know where they well, are. <laughs> but they're not as curious as we would like them yeah. to be. Yeah. Well, know? it may come later. It may yeah. come later. I, well, they're 40. I'm mean, so uh, like Yeah. Well, well, I'm very, my, um, I, I have a thing about, partially because of so much loss, I have a thing about I need to be in touch with my kids and I need for them to know where I am and I want to yeah. know that they're okay. I, yeah, yeah. So, but my daughter and her husband, they really like to travel, and um, he's also British, so they just came back from a ten, yeah. nice 10 days. And I, think, I think my kids are homebodies. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think you have to have a curiosity. You, you really have to have a curiosity. Yes. You know, you can't miss what you don't know, and if you've never experienced the joys and the, and the um, I would say almost exaltation, the, the, the lessons you learn. If you've never had those exchanges, you know, 
you don't miss it. You don't know what you're missing. I mean, I don't understand why people take cruises, and I don't understand why people take, I mean, I do understand why older people take organized travel, but I, we just absolutely never do organized travel. We self-drive, you know. <laughs> yeah. And we don't go just to beautiful places. Yeah. You know, we go to Sarajevo. Yeah. We, 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 that was our last trip before this one. Yeah. I was in Yugoslavia when it was all Yugoslavia. Oh, okay. And I remember that it was very beautiful, and I remember that Sarajevo was very beautiful, but I didn't have a clear memory of it. So we started in Sarajevo, which was phenomenal for all kinds of reasons. Again, the people that we interacted with and the Children's Museum had just opened and the Tunnel Museum. So we started and we drove the whole Croatian uh, coast to Split with various stuffs. Split, one of our favorite cities. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you do the Baltics, yeah. Everything Yeah. If you do the Baltics, um, Riga was our favorite. So we started in Riga, but if I would actually say do it in reverse because Riga is the best one. Yeah. 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 So I think. Uh, yeah. I think our next trip next year we're going to. Um, we didn't go to Poland on this trip. We talked about that. Maybe go to Poland, and then we haven't done southern Germany, the Bavarian Black yeah. Forest stuff. That's what we're going next year. Uh, well, that's, I think, what we're doing next year. And then we're going to go back to our two favorite parts of England, which is the Lake District and Cornwall and Devon. Oh, okay. We're actually at the point now of wanting to go back to places that we really have loved. Yeah. And oftentimes it's disappointing because they're just not what they used to be. The two and the two places, the two places we haven't been that we always wanted to is uh, my uh, my husband's not so keen on this, but I want to go to Patagonia, and we both wanted to do uh, Tibet and um, um, Bhutan, and we haven't done that. And I just don't think I can face a, a coach ticket pet Trans Pacific again, you know. But um, and then I here's on my bucket list. I don't have a lot left on my bucket list, but I want to go to a working dude ranch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a story in here, by the way, about um, um, me and two of my friends since high school days going on a, um, a trip in the Canadian Rockies that was billed as a, a soft adventure. Oh. And so that was fun, you know, helicoptering up the mountain to hike and stuff like that. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's well, thank that. Thank you so much. It's yeah. always fun to hear from my fellow travelers. Yes. Yeah. We can't take any books with us. Is, are, is your book online? No, uh, no, you can buy it on Amazon. I guess you can get it on. I I don't get paid much if you buy it on Kindle, but I think it may be on Kindle. Yeah, I know, We're I know. We're already trying to ship stuff home. We have too much stuff. Yeah, we want to uh, close. For the weight of our suitcase. Yeah. yeah. All has a constant battle too. Yeah. We had no winter clothes when we arrived here. We've been in summer for like oh. two years. Oh. <laughs> Five years, really. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, where we didn't really need really warm clothing, and mm. we got here without. Mm. We got to get some. Mm. Well, when, you, when you're, how long are you going to be in this area? Just, just another week. Just oh, just another week. Because yeah. um, I was going to say that, you know, maybe the library would have a copy or oh, you can, I don't know. The thing is you can read parts of it in a bookstore and yeah. you don't have to read the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you.